We come today to the very heart of what we have been aiming toward. Not, not really. I don't mean that that way. You cannot, you cannot ever escape the primacy of the fruit of the Spirit. This comes first. And not until you, as a child of God, are bearing this fruit, are you able then to lay any legitimate claim to the things that we will get into today. But what we get into today is that which has focused a dramatic attention of our century upon the things of the Spirit. And these are the gifts. The gifts, of course, are dramatic. And people are intrigued by the gifts. And they immediately want to plunge into the gifts. There's a story in the Bible of a man who fell prey to just such carnal desire as that. His name was Simon. He was a sorcerer. We call him Magus because Magus is a Magus is the fifth and highest step in the hierarchy of witchcraft. When this man saw that uh, by the laying on of the hands of the apostles that people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Samaria, he desired of them an, a power that he might be able to do the same thing. He miscalculated the things of the Spirit, however, because he presumed that it was some kind of a hocus-pocus, abracadabra, mumbo-jumbo thing that would bring about the uh, power that he wanted. And Peter, filled with uh, anger and filled with a, a, a violent opposition to such evil as that, raged out at Simon Magus and dismissed him as being the person in the gall of bitterness, the bond of iniquity in the gall of bitterness. But nevertheless, his fascination with the powers of spiritual things never did turn him loose. Simon Magus had in Samaria and in a number of other places of the, e of the East had uh, made quite a name for himself and he was known uh, throughout the region as a great power of God. I teach a great deal on him and others in the Bible and there were others in the Bible who tried to have the same exercise of power without having the fruit. They did not care for the fruit, but they wanted the power that comes for the gifts. Well, in, in my book, <coughs> The Anatomy of Evil, which probably is the most um, frequently used uh, seminar that I give nowadays, because it is a study of the kinds of, uh, of evils that we're facing right here uh, in America and in every part of the world today the occult, the cults, the witchcraft, all of the things that are happening today and what our position as Christians uh, should be. But we encounter Simon again. It doesn't close out in the book of Acts. But we pick up the story of Simon again in the ecclesiastical history of Eusebius Eusebius devotes a great deal of attention to Simon and shows how he has made his way from Samaria into Rome. And in Rome, he has enchanted the people of Rome, including the emperor. They have now begun to worship him as a god. They have now erected statues to him because of his fakery, because of his 
apparent working of miracles. And the story is told of how he finally died. And that is when he made claim that he could fly. And great paraphernalia was rigged up uh, by the Roman leadership. And the emperor sat there and ordered him to fly. And of course he couldn't. And he fell to the ground. And that is how Simon Magus died. That all illustrates something that we are seeing duplicated in our day. And you have to understand this. Men of today have become fascinated with the power of the gifts. They always have been fascinated by the power of the gifts. The Corinthians were fascinated with tongues. Various charlatans were fascinated by other aspects of the gifts. Now the gifts, when the Lord gives the gifts of the Spirit, he is allowing us as mortal men and women to exercise a power that belongs to him. We'll look at that momentarily. I'm only going into this because I want to review what I have said here. And I want you to understand before I do so, don't even begin to think of the gifts until you have the fruit. There is no such thing as legitimately leapfrogging over the fruit into the gifts. Now the Bible warns us in the last days that there will be spurious signs and wonders. And there are going to be some who will come to the Lord in the judgment day. Who will say, Lord, Lord, have we not in thy name done cast out demons and done many wonderful works? Notice that they did not lay claim to having lived love and joy and peace. They didn't say, Lord, we have lived a holy life. But they mention gifts. And they have deluded themselves because in the last days men will deceive and be deceived. Until for them to tell the Lord in the judgment that surely they believed it. So here, and I have left them on the board this morning for you to get one final look at them. This is the measuring stick that we all should keep in mind at all times. The Lord wants me to have the gifts. He intends me to have the gifts. He intends us all to have the gifts. All of the gifts. And they are given to us freely. But first of all, be sure the fruit abounds in your life. Your emotions are immersed in the Spirit and you exude love and joy and peace. And when you are in contact with others, there it is. You have long-suffering and gentleness and goodness. People should walk on this campus and feel the care and the concern that you have. I told you uh, in our last session about at Lee College when a young man was accepted there and a few individuals on the campus, not just the campus as a whole, but the few individuals intensely took him as a project of their love and concern. And it built him up and established him in the Lord. People should walk on this campus and immediately feel the difference. See the difference and know the difference in this and almost any other campus you could find unless it's as Christian as you are. And as you walk along the earth, you should not even be interested in being known as some great one. 
but as a man of love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and meekness and temperance. Only then is the Lord ready to begin in the building of His church to the doing of the other. I cannot emphasize that too much. I cannot emphasize that too much in this day particularly because there is a certain amour that people have toward the gifts when they want to ignore the fruit. It cannot be done. And when you see a man whose life is bitter and hateful and obnoxious who has no evidence of the fruit I don't care if he seems to heal the sick and to cast out devils or anything else pay it no mind because the Bible says that will happen and the Bible says also that if an angel itself shall preach another gospel than this, pay it no mind. Because there's something somewhere wrong. And we are ostriches with our heads in the sand if we think we, the most powerful, valid movement on earth today are going to get by without the devil trying to foist it off on us. Now if you think those things are of the Middle Ages or of uh, apostolic days, you better think again. You know, I'm originally from the South. And that was a part of the old Confederacy. And uh, they printed up Confederate money. And it still floats around. All along you encounter Confederate money. It's real. It's genuine. It's honest to goodness money. But I don't know a single solitary person that's counterfeiting it. And why? It won't buy anything. It has no power. Well, the devil is not going to counterfeit religions that are not doing something. So when he looks out and sees us, you can be sure of it. He'll do everything he can to confuse the issue. So you start. All I ask you to do is to start right here. Look at these. Always expect things. Now then, after the church of Jesus Christ has received and is showing the fruit of the Spirit, then a second element is added to it, and this is called gifts. I mentioned to you on our, in our first session that gifts comes from the Greek word charisma. Charisma means Favor, kindness, grace, <laughs> gifts. It, it, it means a beneficence, something that is given without having been deserved or earned. But it particularly means the uh, empowerments that we have come to know as the Pentecostal phenomena. This outpouring of gifts occurred along about the beginning of this century and became very, very well publicized all across the United States after 1906. And in 19, or in 1896, it had begun the mountain country of Appalachia. But now then after 1906, because it happened in Los Angeles, it began to be known around the world 
and it became a worldwide religious phenomenon until today it is everywhere. Today, Pentecostals are indeed everywhere. Some time ago, I was in uh, Rome, and a friend of mine had set up a, uh, a conference with me and the Pope. And uh, the day I arrived, an emergency had happened in their church, and they, he was not able to meet me, and the Pope sent me word that uh, because he could not meet me that day, he wanted me to meet with the Secretary of the State, Signor Mazzi, and uh, he would meet me uh, the second day after. I had a meeting in Philadelphia, could not postpone, and I was not able to stay, so I never got to meet with uh, the Pope personally. But I spent a day with Signor Mazzi in the Vatican, went into the papal uh, quarters, and there we met, and there we conferred about what is happening in the Pentecostal world and the kinds of things that are going on now. And this is the thing that really touched me. This wizened old man, uh, this, this uh, aging Secretary of State of the Vatican, uh, fill, his eyes filled with tears and the tears began to roll down his cheeks. And he said, young man, there was a day that we had these things happening in the Catholic Church. See that you never lose them. See that you never let them slip. And I was freshened and heartened to know that instead of my meeting what I had expected I might meet, I had met a hearty endorsement that we keep on doing the things that we uh, have been doing and bringing the message of life to this world and not only showing that God is not dead as a heresy has supposed him to be, but that he is alive and working actively among his people even today. Now, these things came about in the gifts of the Spirit. Now, the gifts of the Spirit uh, require a great deal of understanding if we're, going to, uh, if we're going to understand some of the things that I'll be saying in a later session. Let me read to you now from 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man for profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge with the same Spirit, to another faith with the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing with the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. I would like to read a little more than that, so I'll uh, turn to it here in the uh, uh, New Testament and read directly from uh, there. But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. Now the question comes when the uh, gifts are discussed and these are given to us for our, uh, for our empowerment or for our operation. And if we're going to do the works of Jesus Christ, we're going to have to have something more than human uh, capability. So he gives us these gifts. But now then, immediately, a question begins to arise. Where are the gifts? Where do the gifts uh, uh, reside? Where are they, where are they uh, located? And occasionally, there are some who uh, lay claim upon having specifically and definitely a gift. Please hear me carefully at this point. Please listen to me with great attention and care because this is an important a very important fact the Lord does not violate the fruit or allow us to violate the fruit in the giving of his gifts there are nine of the gifts that are given here we're going to find as we go along a, a grand mixture of the gifts as, as the uh, Bible with indifference, except in one or two places, mixes various gifts, both ministry gifts and, and gifts of power. 
He does this because they are all of one source, and that is from the Spirit of God. But now then, this is something that we have to understand. The Lord gave the gifts to the church. The Lord set the gifts in the church. The church is not timbers and steel and glass. But the church is made up of people, of believers, of followers of Him, devotees of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are the church. So the Lord set the gifts in the church. And in setting the gifts in the church, He expects the church to have all of them operating constantly and consistently for the doing of his work. Now then, occasionally, there were, I don't hear it so much anymore, but I used to in the early days when people didn't understand, they would say, Brother Khan, I have the gift of healing. Brother Khan, I have the gift of this or that or the other. Well, that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says that they are set in the church. All of them. They're all equally in the church. But he gives us as individuals in the church the manifestation of them according to his will. Let me continue to read. Because the, uh, the Lord I think is very, very clear in this point. Read on to the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians and verse 27. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, and after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. He mixes here the gifts and the ministry gifts all together and accords them the same position in the church that they have been set in the church for the church's edification and he manifests them as he will. Now one of the uh, gifts of the uh, Spirit is a word of wisdom. How can I lay claim and say, I have the gift of the word of wisdom, which in and of itself would rub hard against the meekness that I'm to show here. How can I say that I have this or that or the other? The church has all of them. And I, as a part of the church, may be used for a word of wisdom, or a word of knowledge, or the gift of healing, or of any of the others. Now then, if he did it the way some people originally imagined it, I used to have uh, long conversations with several of my friends when, when the Pentecostal movement was uh, just starting out. Two very uh, dear friends of mine uh, discussed these things with me at great length and they, of course, were able to see and are able to see and there was never any question about it. One was uh, Oral Roberts and one was uh, Tia Lawson. We, uh, we, we were frequently together and we discussed these things and so I've always noted with great care their unwillingness to lay claim individually that I have anything. I have the Holy Ghost. I have the Spirit. I have God in me. And in that, they are all there. They are all in the church. And if the Lord needs healing, but the only person present is somebody who has the gift of a word of wisdom, then where is the healing? The gifts are in the church. I am a part of the church, therefore God will use me for any one of them at the time it is needed. 
Now then, there is a certain grandiose uh, idea that people sometimes get. I don't have one of the gifts. I'm a part of the church that has all of the gifts. And all nine of them have at various times, each of the nine of them, I should say, has been manifested in or through or concerning my ministry. Now that's the way it should be on West Coast campus. That is the way it should be in every local church. That is the way it should be everywhere. He has set some in the church. And he mixes all of those and all of these powers that have been set into the church together. Pa apostles and prophets and teachers and miracles and gifts of healings and helps and governments and diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of the miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts. Now, I don't want to dwell on this too long, but it is important for us to understand it. Present today, right now, today, if we are the church that is represented here, there is present in this body today every one of the gifts it is here now to be manifested at the will of the Lord according to the need. If the need is a word of wisdom, then God will manifest the word of wisdom. If the need is healing, then God will manifest healing. If the need is any of them, tongues or interpretation of tongues, then he will manifest them. Having done this, having established these in the church and having set them in the church and made them a part of the church, we uh, sometimes get a little confused because of the way we do things. You know, Sometimes in our understanding of God, we try to make God like us instead of recognizing that we're like God. When uh, we're told that we're made in God's image, which we have already seen, we now try to make God look like us. And we decide that the way I look is the way God looks. Well, that doesn't quite follow. Because if that's what it means, if that's all it means, if, and if we have an anthropomorphic God, and, uh, God is, is like me, then I don't know. If he has ten fingers and I have an accident and cut off three of mine, I've lost part of the image of God. If uh, God has white hair and I have black hair, I'm less in the image of God than a white-headed man. If God has... Uh, Blue eyes, praise God, I hit it there. But why my wife missed it, she's less in the image of God than I am because he's blue-eyed and I am too. You understand? God wants us to be in his image, which is here, not him to be in our image. The same thing is true about his power and his gifts. It belongs to Him. And He gives it to me for the use or manifestation of the church. Praise God. Now then, let me give you another example. If someone should have given me this tie, looking at it, I suppose they did. It is mine. And if I want to, I can do anything I want to with it. I can throw it away. I can abuse it. I can wear it to a dance or a gambling den or a church because it's mine. 
You see, that's the way we give gifts. And because we give gifts that way, that's the way we think God gives gifts. God does not ever give gifts that way. He gives life in Jesus Christ, but by abuse and profanation, we have it no more. He gives the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And if we will maintain it, great. But He doesn't... Oh, man. You, you start down the trail that some people start down, you can live a wicked, lecherous, licentious life and still have all the gifts of God. God doesn't know anything about giving in that way. He gives for a cause. He gives for a purpose. Let me try to illustrate it. I lived in Roanoke, Virginia in a house. It was my house. I know it was my house because it felt like it. It looked like it. It served the purpose. I could come home and kick off my shoes and lie down on the floor and play my music as loud as I wanted to. I could go to the icebox and get anything I wanted. But my wife wasn't looking. <laughs> Otherwise, I might be told that's for supper. If you were to drive along and say, whose house is that? They would say, that's Mr. Conn's house. The neighbor said, that's Mr. Conn's house. The people said, that's Mr. Conn's house. The mail to Mr. Conn came to my house. It looked like my house, felt like my house, and served the purpose of my house. But was it my house? No. It wasn't my house at all. The house belonged to the Church of God in Virginia. And just as long as I was serving the purposes for which it had been built, then it was my house. But as soon as my service was moved to another place, it was not my house. Now suppose someday I had decided to have a real honest to goodness rock and roll old time Georgie hoedown. Now that would be something. And if you could get rock and roll and a Georgia hoedown together, you would have you something going on. And the minute the executive committee heard what was going on or what was afoot, I would have found out whether it was my house or not. Do you understand? It served the purpose of my house. It looked like my house. It felt like my house. But it wasn't my house. Now it wasn't the neighbor's responsibility to keep that in mind. It was mine responsibility. You understand? That's where meekness here comes in our understanding there. You can't be meek here and arrogant here. You've got to have meekness that extends all the way. Hey, it's not mine. It's God's. And He may use me for one particular manifestation so much. And He does that it looks to the world for all as if I have it. Go ahead. Accord it to me. Do what you will. But I had sure better be wise enough to know, hey, it's not mine. It is God's. And God is manifesting it through me. Hmm. I didn't expect the Smiths and the Millers and the Johnsons and the Joneses to keep me in order. And I didn't expect them to go around and always say, well, it's not really Brother Khan's house. It's really this, that, and the other. No, sir, they never would do that. That's Brother Khan's house. But old Brother Khan knew this is not my house. Mm -hmm. This is the church's house. And I will do with it what God expects to be done. So the Lord uses me for one gift and he does it over and over and over and over. And it looks like to the world that I have it. But I better know I don't have it. God has it. And it's in the church and he dispenses it and manifests it and he chooses me on many, many occasions to do it. Mm. Well, my... Uh, Experience has been that I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I spoke with tongues. I've spoken in tongues uh, very often. But not constantly. 
but my wife does. When she and I go to pray almost every day, I hear her speaking in tongues. And it sounds to me, man, that that, that lady speaks with tongues constantly. Well, the Lord knows why. And it sounds to me like she has the gift. But she knows she does not have a gift. The gift is in the church and God uses her for its manifestation. I'm only trying to show you how it can look like and seem like an individual has this or that or the other. But that individual in his meekness needs to know that it is God's. And it belongs to him. Now then, when God gives the gifts, He gives great and glorious power. And so the devil is at work today trying to confuse the whole issue. I was out here on the west coast where all things ultimately get and come to full fruit and then roll like a wave across the country. You live in the incubation area of almost all things. So in the 1950s, we had something called the latter rain. Did you ever hear of it? It was born in a Bible school on the plains of Saskatchewan. Transplanted to California and under this beautiful sun, it ripened fast. And then it rolled like a noxious wave across the country. And you never saw such things happening in all your life. You saw bloody crosses appearing in foreheads. You saw hands turned into oil wells. You saw the most refined theologists. And one of the greatest theologies that rolled out of it was the plateau system. If you had the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that's where I am, then you were on the first plateau. But if you would just have a little more faith, you could rise up to the next plateau. Now, when you got to the next plateau, then you did greater works than the Lord did. And if you, once you had done that, you moved on up to the third plateau. And when you got up to the third plateau, oh my goodness, now then, you begin to be absolutely something extraordinary and you don't need all the uh, props or all of the, all of the kinds of support systems that other preachers and other people have to have. And when you got there, then you moved up to the fourth uh, plateau. And when you got to the fourth plateau, uh, with that, you then become the Word of God. With that, you don't longer need what Paul said or John or... Peter or James because everything you say is as much the word of God as what they said. Therefore, you can forget what they said because from here on out, it, you are the word of God. And once you, once you got to that, then you move to the fifth plateau. And when you get to that fifth plateau, then you are so divine and you are so heavenly at that point that you no longer are bound by earthly uh, compacts and contracts, but you are a free and new person. You, you are your own law. You are your own everything, and that went far enough to include the marriage contract. And I saw people that I had one time known rot away with this heresy, talking to me about the Lord is going to show me my soulmate. Now then, if you had married you an old flesh mate somewhere back down the line, that doesn't mean you're bound to her because God will show you a soul mate and when that happens you are free to leave your flesh mate and take up with your soul mate. Well, I saw that happening. I saw that literally take place. But you know, a one-eyed mule in Georgia ought to have sense enough and sight enough to see what was going on. I never did see one of these super duper hyper spiritual saints leave a pretty young flesh mate and take up with a wrinkle faced gray headed old soul mate. 
Everything I saw was a man leaving his poor old gray-headed flesh mate and taking up with one of these retreads. <laughs> these flossed out and dolled up soulmates. Man, the most wonderful thing became spiritual you ever saw. <laughs> now that happened beginning here and it rolled all the way and I saw at one time nine of my former colleagues swept away with that heresy. Thank God it's dead. But I went to a meeting out here on the West Coast and the time came for them to have a gift giving session. Everybody that wants a gift, line up, we're going to give the gifts. I'm going to tell you where it was, but it's out here. And so this man began to give the gifts. I give you the gift of healing as they come by. I give you the gift of tongues. I give you the gift of uh, interpretation. Another one. I give you the gift of wisdom. There's no such gift. I give you the gift of knowledge. There is no such gift. But he was giving them anyway. And he had to, and he ran through them all over. He did it over and over and over until he got tired of that. Then he started giving gifts I never did hear of. I give you the gift of music. I give you the gift of a pleasant voice. I give you the gift of a pleasant personality. Well, bless God, I know a bunch that need that. When you leave the Word of God, there is no extent to the error you can get into. And that's what the Lord wants the church to hear today. Get yourself solid and balanced into the things that God has given us. Hold them steadfastly and maintain Amen. that which God wants us to have. Mm. I accosted these people while I was there that night. Man, I stood there weaving and wobbling for two hours. I wasn't waving and wobbling, but the congregation was. And I got tired, looked back at the clock to see what time it was, but they'd had their eye on me all the time. And the man from the pulpit said, it's 10 o'clock, and don't you dare leave. I've got a hook in your jaw. <laughs> well, the hook didn't hold. <laughs> and I got out. <laughs> and so on. That's the reason my wife doesn't like me to travel with Ray Hughes. We poke around and stuff like that just to see what's going on. And he and I were together that night <laughs> just to see what in the world is going on. See people setting the wash water from where they have washed their socks because it has become holy water now. All in the name of Pentecost. People wanting power. People wanting power. People wanting power. Then if that is, doesn't work and if it's wrong, then what does the scripture mean in Romans 1 where Paul does indeed mention the giving of gifts? This is what he said. Romans 1, 11 and 12. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. To the end ye may be established. That's what he said. He told the Roman congregation, I want to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. People have taken that scripture and have run amok with it in believing that one individual can give to another individual a spirit, a gift of the spirit. That is not what it says. Let's see what it says. Because he explains it. It goes on, that is. In other words, let me explain. That is, come. That I may be comforted. Comfort means to be empowered or blessed with you. It doesn't mean a wiping of tears. It is with power. With you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now, what he's talking about is very clear. He was talking about something that they could give to him just like he can give to them. 
I've been out here for several days now trying my best to give you a gift, a favor, a blessing. And that gift is in understanding, in love, enlightenment, teaching, fellowship. But I can assure you, you have been giving me as much as I have been giving you. You have been giving me love and fellowship and companionship and encouragement and I will leave here with my heart rejoicing because of what you have given to me. So we, it is a, it is a process of uh, sharing, of reciprocity in which we reciprocate with one another. He wanted to get to the Romans so I can draw strength from you and you can draw strength from me. Now there is another. And this is when Paul wrote to Timothy. And Paul, in writing to Timothy, I'll hold this one uh, mainly until I get to the ministry gifts because it's very important when we get there. But I'll mention it here only enough to say that in this instance he is talking about a gift of the ministry. All of these gifts were indeed signified by a laying on of hands. This was a, this was a function of the church in recognizing that what God has called a man to we see, we recognize, and we will support him and send him out. We do it today. We lay hands on people to signify ordination, to signify licensure, to signify that people have been uh, sent out. But I'll hold that one until later. But I do want to uh, go far enough to tell you at this time that is exactly what he is speaking out there. Now the gifts. There are precedents in the uh, Old Testament. And I have Exodus 31. And I want you to, I mentioned to you at the last session about my writing to the custodian and to the maintenance people and to others that have uh, been a blessing to the kingdom of God through the work of their hands. Sometimes God gives a man a gift of working with his hands. That's one of the most beautiful things and you need to always bear it in mind. And I told uh, a man just uh, a few days ago, I was amazed to see what he was able to do and to see how he was doing it uh, for the uh, work of the Lord. In, uh, in uh, Exodus 31, the Lord spake, saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in, not, and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and in silver and in brass and in cutting of stones to set them and in carving of timber to work with all manner of workmanship. That's a gift of God. There's something that bothers me and it's when these people, I see people occasionally who become so enamored of themselves that they belittle other gifts that God has given them. God has blessed me in pastoring churches and being everywhere I've ever been yet where there's a Bezalel and a Holy App. Men that God has actually given the gifts of keeping the works working of keeping it going. Now that was only a precedent to show that God may give a man the ability to do things that are of great, great importance. He gave Solomon a gift of wisdom. The question came, comes, how did he do it? Well, God did not give Solomon a tied up, packaged a portion of wisdom and just set it down in his head. He gave him an accelerated skill and ability at learning so that he was indeed a man of wisdom. Tragically, this failed him in the end because of his own 
derelictions. And the wisest of all men would die in a great tragedy of biblical uh, record. Now then I come to a point that you're following me in your outline right now that I must be very gentle with because I don't want to say anything wrong but I want you to hear it. When Jesus Christ came to earth remember that he is God he is a part of the Godhead but he subjected himself to earthly confinements in order to be born. For nine months he lived in the womb of Mary. When he was born, he was encapsulated in flesh. The word we use for that is incarnation or in flesh. He lived his lifetime on earth in flesh. <clears throat> Yet he was God. Now then, in order for him to be truly man and truly God, and he was both, he had to willingly subject himself to certain limitations. There is a very revealing scripture about this in the second chapter of Luke. And I think it illustrates what I am trying to say. In the 52nd verse it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom. Increased. You cannot increase perfection. But he increased in wisdom and stature just as he had to grow physically in stature. He as a child had to grow in wisdom and in favor. This favor meaning of course his understanding and ability to work with and to do the thing that he'd come to do. God and man. Now this gives you a hint of what the incarnation meant to Jesus Christ. And someday when you're a preacher, you who are going to be preachers, you think what Jesus Christ sacrificed to come to this earth. C.S. Lewis has uh, a statement, a development of truth in one of his books. I don't remember which one now. C.S. Lewis is the writer which I read most of all, I guess, and whose writings are most significant to me. He said, in order for you to begin to grasp what it meant for Jesus to leave thrown in heaven and to come to earth you need to look around yourself suppose Lewis said you should become so burdened so intent on helping some other order of animal life and he mentions the doll family, that you are willing to leave the comforts of your home, of your companionships, of all that you're accustomed to, and become a dog in order to help the dog. Knowing that in the end, instead of them appreciating what you have done, they will turn on you and rend you and tear you and kill you. Said, 
When you begin to comprehend such love as would be required to do that, only then have you begun to comprehend the love of God when He so loved the world that His Son came to the earth to live like a man without a place to lay His head and die that I might live. Mm. There came a day that Jesus had to say to the heavenly host, I will leave you for a time. And to the heavenly father, I will leave you for a time because down there there's a whole creation that I've got to help. The prophets had not been able to do it. No one had been able to do it. I must go down there give myself for them. Mm -hmm. And while he was down here, to say that Jesus Christ had a gift or had the gifts of the Spirit would not be accurate any more than to say he had the Holy Ghost. He was it. He had it all. But I want us to read now some of the observations that are so necessary for us to have. Turn to page 99 where I'm discussing the gifts and then on to 103 which is Christ and the gifts. In his earthly life, Jesus manifested all spiritual gifts fully. It would be erroneous to say that he manifested the gifts of the Spirit as such, just as it would be erroneous to say that he lived a Christian life. We live a Christian life when we pattern ourselves after him. And we manifest gifts of the Spirit when we do the works he has called us to do. Jesus did that which was natural for him to do. During the days of his incarnation, Jesus relied upon God the Father and the power of the Spirit as we must do in our lives for Him. It is said that He was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. He said, I cast out devils by the Spirit of God. Jesus clearly taught that the Father was the source of His power during His days on earth. As our example, he submitted himself to the will of the Father and the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Now then, this is what I'm going to read to you from the Word. John 5, verses 19, 20, and 30. This is Jesus now. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of Himself. Now that's not Charles Kahn saying that about Jesus. That's Jesus saying that about Himself. He said, of Myself I can do nothing. The Son, but what He seeth the Father do. For what things soever He, the Father, doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. Now let me, let me clarify this. Jesus on earth was in flesh. The incarnation. While he was on earth in the incarnation, he exercised all gifts freely. But he emphasized that he had to do it by a power from heaven 
according to the will of the Father. Now he said that. This is what he did. Now listen to me and be very, very attentive because this is a delicate point and if you think you've misunderstood me, go to the tapes later and listen to them because I want you to hear me and hear me very, very well. It was not until after his crucifixion after the passion of Jesus, when he had secured the salvation of mankind by obedience to the cross, he said, he said this only now. Until then, he has said, I cannot do it of myself. I do it through the Father. But when he had proved his obedience to the cross and my salvation is secured, then and then only did he say, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Glory. The, the, that thought is so rich it just staggers me and I'm left weak even in contemplating it. Can you imagine what a homecoming there was when Jesus came out of the tomb and ascended back into heaven, back to the place where he had lived for all eternity. He was going home again. And according to C.S. Lewis, and I can agree, the sacrifice of his coming was a greater sacrifice than his dying because his dying was ready for his home going to be back with the Father and the heavenly host once again. Glory, 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 glory to God. Hallelujah. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. I have now what has been mine from the beginning, but I laid aside. I had it but I had it through the Father and through the Spirit. I've taken it back up now because I've been obedient to the cross and the works of the devil are defeated and the work of redemption is accomplished. Now you listen to me. How arrogant we become Then when we try to lay claim without the same degree of devotion and dedication that Jesus had upon the power that he had. Nothing is more sickening to me than to see people running willy-nilly through the fruit and trying to lay claim on the gifts. If Jesus gave the example that he gave, then you can be very, very sure that God will not release to us the power of the gifts until we have proved ourselves fit to handle it. Do you understand me? Glory. Let me try to illustrate it. I love horses. In fact, I have 360 horses. And I really do take care of my horses. I feed them regularly with good gas and oil. I keep them in stabled under the hood of my car. All 360 of them. And when I get ready for my horses to spring to action, I see that I do it carefully. Now, I have had 
Not one, not two, not three or four, but twelve teenagers <laughs> who live only for the day that they can get a hold of them horses. <laughs> Boy, I want to get a hold of those horses. Dad, when are you going to let me drive? You know, a little word to you parents, when your kid learns to drive, get all you can out of them. They'll go anywhere then. <laughs> After they get a little jaded of it, you can't even get them to go to the corner grocery store anymore. But boy, when they first get to learn to control those horses, they are ready to go anywhere. Well, now, for me to turn one of my little old adolescent teenage kids loose with my 360 horses would be insanity. Until they prove themselves worthy and capable and able to handle those horses. I wouldn't get in a car with them for your love or money. I send her mother with them. <laughs> she takes them out and she stays with them until after a while she says honey I believe they're ready and when she says they're ready then I go out and I get with them the way of chauvinism there now just facts of life <laughs> and I test them out and say okay you know how to handle it you know the rules, you know all the about it. Then we go and they take a, a test and an examination before the proper state authorities. They get a license. And even then, I don't say, okay, there they are, they're yours, use them now like you want to. No, sir. They can come up with the most ingenious things of wanting to do with that car you ever heard of. <laughs> I'm not turning loose to them. No, sir, I'm not. I'm a responsible citizen. I'm not going to turn them over to such power as that until they prove they've got some responsibility. I don't want them dragging around in my car. Bring my horses home and they're full of mud. I wonder where they've been. Oh, no. I've got better sense than that. Before that, before I turn all that power over to them, I want them to prove that they're responsible enough to handle it. Isn't that good sense? You older people say yes. Yes. And you younger people think a little while. And I'll ask you 20 years from now, and you'll be saying yes too. Well, then if I am that careful and that responsible, you can be sure God is that responsible. He will not release to us the whole power of heaven until we have proved that we are capable of handling it. Glory. 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 And the only time these hurt, and they do hurt sometimes, or the pretense of them, is when this has been bypassed. This has been that. Now, I'm going to stop right here today. I haven't finished all the things I have to say about the conditions and all the gifts. We'll get to them individually. But tonight, when we get back here at 7 o'clock, I want to resume on some of these uh, conditions and circumstances surrounding the gifts.